look at a passage where we see that very thing where God's people, uh, something they were called to do that they should have been able to do, but were not able to do because of sin. It's in uh, Joshua chapter 7. They lost a battle that they should not have lost. And because uh, it was, this was on account of their, their sin. And I think as we look at this too, it's a, a story of Achan. We need to understand as well that there's more going on than, than just Achan. Achan was the occasion that God used to humble his people. But you can tell from the overall account that they needed to be humbled. Because after they had been at Jericho... They go to Ai, and there's no mention of them consulting the Lord about how they're supposed to take Ai. They look at it, and they send in some people. Oh, yeah, we can just use a few guys. It's no problem. And and they go in. And uh, so they needed to be humbled and realize that they were before the Lord. And, of course, Achan was the one that transgressed the particular commandment that God had made about taking things that were um, not to be taken, that God had forbidden them to take from the spoils. And uh, that was the occasion for the judgment. But they all had to suffer this judgment. And it brought a humbling to them so that they would seek the Lord. So listen as I read it to you. This is Joshua chapter 7. The children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. But let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people, therefore the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about thirty-six of them, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the, on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I, I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. (coughs) get up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall be... shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord 
and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Now let me just pause here for a minute and make a couple of comments. You understand what is going on here. They, they had been sent to, to execute the people of Canaan because for hundreds of years they had been in hard rebellion against God, offering their children as sacrifices and any number of other things that they were doing to their false gods. And so this was a very serious matter. And they were, doing, they were involved in truly a holy war that God had appointed to them at this time. And it was not where they were just to go in and take all the things and say, look, we've got all these spoils from war. But it was rather a war that God had directed where he was executing his punishment upon bringing his punishment upon these people that had rebelled against them and using Israel as his agent. And so they needed to remember that this was for the Lord. It was not about it was not about them. Verse 16 continues. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. Now they did that by casting lots of a sort to determine who was, uh, cho- who, who was uh, chosen or, or acknowledged to be the one that was guilty. Verse 17, he brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zar- Zarhites. And he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. There they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. And there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. And there we'll end the reading of God's holy word. You can turn to Mark in your Bibles as we'll be... I'm preaching from there. Today we're going to see that Jesus identifies his generation as a faithless generation. Jesus has been ministering to them now for a couple of years as the Messiah that God had promised to come and save his people. It was only recently that even his own disciples had come to recognize that he was the Christ, yet it's clear that they have no idea of the work that he has been given to do in making himself an offering for their sins. He had told them plainly of his suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection, but they didn't accept what he said. They didn't really take it in. As he had told Peter, who represented them all, you are not mindful of the things of God. The old version, uh, you do not savor the things of God. You're out of touch with God and His work that's going on through me, Jesus said, among you. In chapter 9, where we are now, Jesus had taken His three leading disciples, Peter, James, and John, 
up a high mountain where he was transfigured. That is, his glory as the Son of Man was revealed. It was shone forth in a visible way to them. In our text today, Jesus and the three disciples have descended from the mountain. We talked about that last time, saw their conversation on their way down. And they are have and in the passage we look at today, it's when they return to the nine disciples that were left behind. We're told of the deplorable situation in which they find those nine disciples. Let's take a look. Listen as I read it to you. It's Mark 9, beginning in verse 14. Mark 9, 14. This is the word of God. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him into the He has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. May the Lord bless us, for we have heard his holy word. And may he bless us now as we hear the exposition of his word. See here how Jesus identifies his generation as a faithless generation. It's quite a thing to say returning from the Mount of Transfiguration to the nine disciples that he had left behind, Jesus found chaos. There was a dispute going on. Verse 14, when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. What a contrast this was. Jesus had been in the presence of the glory cloud with those who had been perfected, uh, the spirits of just men made perfect, Moses and Elijah. And here he was hearing the Father declare his pleasure with him on the mount and enjoying the company of these ones. But now, in the valley below, he finds a very different world. He finds a dispute going on between the scribes and his disciples. Much confusion and strife among the church. His covenant people, these were all covenant people. And here they were contending with each other and divided. It's similar to Moses' experience in many ways when he returned from the presence of God on the mountain at Mount Sinai, where he'd been in the glory cloud receiving instruction from God to find, coming back to find the congregation worshiping the golden calf. It should not have been like this. These were all covenant people, the scribes, the multitude, and especially the nine disciples. 
were those who were God's people. Jesus' presence among them brings a great change in the whole atmosphere. The crowd responded as soon as they saw Jesus. Verse 15 says, Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. He was still very popular with the multitudes. You remember people have been following him around everywhere he would go. There would be crowds of people who were coming to be healed. And uh, they, they were glad to see him because only these nine disciples had been there. Jesus had not been around. The scribes had seized on the opportunity when Jesus was away and the leading disciples were away to, uh, to, to take the nine disciples and, who were not able to defend Jesus, their master. And these scribes took that opportunity to reproach their master, Jesus Christ. Jesus now, on the scene, takes control of the situation. It's like kind of this thing where you're talking about someone who has a great deal of authority and you're going on about them and saying, rawr, rawr, and going on with all your complaints. And then they walk in the room and you, oh, you know, he calls the scribes to speak to him about their concerns. Verse 16, and he asks the scribes, what are you discussing with them? The scribes were not so confident to take on Jesus. Now remember, these were the scribes that were from this region. We, don't, we think these are the local scribes. They were the ones that would come down from Jerusalem every once in a while. And those guys were a little more confident because they hadn't had as much time with Jesus. But these guys knew that when you talk to Jesus, it doesn't go well. Like he always gets the best of you. They were so happy that he was gone because now they could, they could make mincemeat out of these uh, nine disciples. But there he is again. None of them answer a word. Jesus says, what are you disputing? They're all quiet. Okay, and uh, you, you can feel the tension in the air. You know, the question's gone out. What are you discussing here? Everybody's just, who, us? <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> and uh, then the father of the demon-possessed boy speaks up and explains that he's kind of the guy that's in the middle of all this, um, the, the occasion for the dispute that's gone on here. He had brought his son to Jesus to have the demon cast out of him, but finding that Jesus was gone, he presented him to the nine disciples that were there, and they were unable, the language there suggests, they didn't have the strength to cast it out. Apparently, this is the occasion then that the scribes took to ridicule the disciples and even more to ridicule their master. But now Jesus has come, and they're quiet. So Jesus came then to find this dispute going on, it's part of the disorder and the, the trouble that was there. And then there's the other thing that we, we just see here. Besides the dispute, there is this boy in this abysmal state that no one is able to help. This is part of the deplorable situation that Jesus found when he came off the mount. Listen to how this demoni demoniac boy's condition is described. Verse 17. The man explains, he says, teacher, I brought you my son, he was expecting to bring him to Jesus, who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. This is a covenant child. This is a descendant of Abraham. This was not a physical malady or a sickness that comes over you that is not necessarily associated with sin. Sometimes we're chastened. But this, this is demon possession. It can only happen as a result of gross sin and unbelief on the part of someone who's in the covenant. Unbelief and sin that has not been dealt with. It should not be the case that a child of the covenant is under the dominion of Satan. God's people are holy to the Lord. They belong to Him. And He promises to them and to their parents deliverance from Satan, from bondage to sin. He is there to deliver His people from this sort of thing. Satan will not have dominion over us if we look to the Lord. So there are these two things, this dispute 
and this demon-possessed boy. And because of these two things, Jesus denounces his generation as a faithless generation. Look at verse 19. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? What strong words these are. A faithless generation is a generation that is without faith in God. And again, these were the people in all the world who were set apart from all others to be God's covenant people. They were circumcised. They had the promise of God with that to circumcise their hearts, to love the Lord their God. They had the promise of God to redeem them from their sins and from bondage to the wicked one. They were called to look to him in faith for complete forgiveness and for new life in service to God. But despite all these privileges, they weren't doing that. They weren't looking to the Lord. They were guilty of unbelief. The God of heaven had been so gracious to them, stretching out his hand all day long to a disobedient and hard-hearted people, offering them the free grace and salvation. Come to me, look to me and be saved, he called. And they would not hear. Now their unbelief was brought into focus with this demon-possessed boy. Let's think about that. First, there was the unbelief of the father and of the boy. Covenant child could not be possessed like this, as I said, apart from rebellious unbelief in his parents and in him if he was of age. We're not told how they got into this situation, but this was not like catching the flu or having some kind of sickness. This was demon possession. Demon possession, the result of sinful covenant breaking, of rejecting God as our Redeemer. But there was also unbelief. Talking about the unbelieving generation, right? What makes it up? He's not talking just to an individual here. He's talking about a whole generation. There was also the unbelief of Jesus' disciples. Here, this father had come to repentance. He had heard about Jesus and he knew that he needed deliverance for him and for his son. So he came to Jesus to find God's saving help. But instead, he found helpless, impotent disciples. These disciples were among the 12 that Jesus had chosen to lead the church after he went away. He was leading them. And in training them, he had given them, bestowed on them power to cast out demons and to heal all kinds of sickness. This is something, again, that they were supposed to be able to do. Just like Israel was supposed to be able to conquer all the Canaanites unless something was wrong. They were culpable for this inability. Unbelieving generation. These were the men upon whom the present generation depended in the future to lead them in the way of God's salvation after Christ went away. They show that they're not at all up for the task. They're not prepared. Jesus goes away just for a short time and everything goes to ruin. Soon he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's on his way to be crucified. What hope is there for the generation whose leading ministers are faithless? No wonder that Jesus says, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? It's a great concern. What are you going to do when I'm gone? You can't even get along for a short, for a few days. And besides this, look at the scribes of Jesus' generation. They're certainly part of the unbelieving generation, even more so. These are the trained teachers of the precious word of God who had all of those wonderful promises set forth about God's salvation, of him being our redeemer, of him being our Lord, of us being able to come to him and be received by him and live as his people. They had all of that in the word of God and all the promises about Christ, the redeemer who is to come. 
And now he came, and they didn't see it. They missed the whole boat. They were the leading teachers. What hope for this faithless generation whose ministers don't even know Christ? But I tell you, Jesus' denouncement of his generation could be leveled against our generation as well. In fact, where has there ever been a generation that was truly full of faith, even among the covenant people? We touched on this last week. Promise of grace was given to Adam after the fall. But there was only one family in each generation from Adam to the flood that believed, or at least it appears so. Certainly in the time of Noah, there was only one. And what about the time of Moses? What did the Lord call them? A crooked and perverse generation. They would not come to God for salvation. Here he had shown himself to them again and again. And they would not look to the Lord for their deliverance. Time would fail us to do more than mention the time of the judges, the kingdom years, the years after the exile. And then there is this generation of Christ that ended up delivering him to be crucified. Where are these are the people of faith. These are the covenant people. Where is their faith? If they don't have faith, the whole generation is a faithless generation. And though the gospel did indeed come into the world and Jesus came, and there, there is still, after that, much unbelief in the church, much refusal to come to God for His mercy. All day long, God's hand is stretched out to a disobedient and rebellious people, the offer of salvation, the call of grace, and yet they remain in unbelief. Instead of coming to him to be delivered from sin, even those in the church continue to cherish their sin and cling to it, never finding repentance, never finding deliverance from the dominion of sin. Now, of course, we're not talking about perfection when we say deliverance from the dominion of sin. We're talking about from the controlling power of sin, the dominion dominance of sin over you. And so many ministers and elders are full of unbelief. Like the scribes in Jesus' day, they don't even recognize the Christ, the true Christ of the Scriptures. They reject whatever they and their hearers don't like from God's Word. They modify the Word of God to appeal to what people want to hear. And they have nothing but an empty show of discipleship. Just like the Jews did when Jesus came. They had their religion. They had their God talk. They had their picture of faith, but they had no real faith. We too are a faithless generation. The evil of this demon-possessed boy represents the evil that our Lord would deliver us from if we would come to him in faith. But I'm happy to tell you that Jesus is wonderfully gracious and ministers grace both to individuals and to ministers. Let's take a look now at his gracious dealings. First, with individuals as represented by this father and his son. And then with the ministers of his people, represented by the nine disciples. See how he graciously ministers to the man and his demon-possessed son. This is so much the way of our gracious Lord, isn't it? It is a wonderful way. This man came to Jesus in faith, but now his faith has been shaken. He tells of how he brought his son to Jesus because of the unclean spirit that had tormented his son for so long. We can expect that he had heard about Jesus and about how he was delivering people from such demon possession, from unclean spirits. This man had a work of the Holy Spirit in him that made him want to come to God for deliverance, that the deliverance that God has for his people. He had come in faith and expectation by the grace of God, then only to be disappointed when Jesus' disciples were not able to cast out the demon. As a consequence, he dishonors Christ as a man whose faith has been disrupted, has been shaken. Look at how he speaks to the Son of God. Jesus says to him, first of all, Bring him 
to me. That should have raised his hopes. The Messiah says, bring him to me. Should have immediately renewed his faith. The master has come. His disciples have failed. He had denounced their unbelief. And now he's calling, bring him to me. Obviously, he is prepared to do something. Of course, he can deliver him. But instead, this man says from the middle of verse 22, reading from the middle of verse 22, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus' weak, unbelieving disciples have caused this man to question whether Jesus can do anything, if you can do anything. What a heavy responsibility ministers have as those called to minister in the name of Christ. Indeed, what a heavy responsibility we all have as Christians that our lack of faith would infect others and destroy faith that is rising up in them. How dreadful that would be to be the cause of stumbling to another. And it happens. Jesus says, he rebukes the Pharisees and says, you make proselytes twice as much the sons of hell as you yourselves are. People that are coming and seeking. Now, of course, if a person's truly seeking, God's promise is that they will find. And God's providence, so all of us, and especially ministers, can contribute to the unbelief of others. Jesus, Jesus makes this clear in his teaching. But look at how Jesus restores this man. Okay? He, he was in a bad state right now. He, he was, well, if you can do anything, you know, anything you can do, a little bit, even a little bit would help. <coughs> look how Jesus restores him. First, he challenges him about his sinful doubting. Let's be clear here. He said the ministers were the cause of it. But just because ministers have failed does not mean that Jesus fails. Just because ministers rep- misrepresent him does not mean that Jesus is as they represent him. God stretches out his hand of mercy and he calls all to come to him with their sin and receive his salvation. And he doesn't say they might be saved if they come. He might be possible for them to be saved. He presents himself from Genesis to Revelation as a gracious redeemer to everyone who would look to him. So when the man says, if you can't come, if you can, (coughs) Jesus turns it back on him and says, if you can believe, if you can believe, he says to the man, or as some manuscripts would have it, he simply says, if you can. Depending on what version of the Bible you have, you'll have one of those uh, presented there. And the second one that I mentioned like in the ESV and some other versions, NIV, he's mocking what the man has said to him. Like, it doesn't have the word believe it. If, if you can, like he's quoting what he's just said. And he's doing that in either case. And really, the outcome is the same. It amounts to the same thing as far as what Jesus is getting at. Because he adds... All things are possible to him who believes. So the meaning is clear. If you come to Jesus looking to him for deliverance, of course, he is able to deliver you. There's no question about that. That's the point. It doesn't mean that you can come and demand whatever you want from him. That's not the way of real faith. You don't come and say, you know, Lord, my neighbor's bugging me, you know, Take him out, you know, or whatever. Um, or or you, you can't just come and, and ask for, you know, give me a million dollars or, or, or whatever it is that might be on your mind. That's not the way of real faith. The way of real faith is that you come to God to put yourself into his hands to do his saving work in you. That's what the focus is. And yes, we ask for our daily bread and things like that. But the real focus is you know, faith is I come to God and I say, God, here I am, I'm a mess, you take me. You take my life, you, you transform me, you save me from my sins, you deliver me from bondage to sin. That's the way we come to God. And that's the faith that will be received. It means that, that means that if he has sent you some illness to test you or chasten you, he might not take that away. I've been praying, praying, praying. God won't answer my prayer. 
Well, what were you praying for? It's fine to pray that He'll take away illness, but it's more important to pray that you'll be sanctified and become more like Christ through whatever He sends into your life. He will always deliver you from the dominion of sin if you seek that. His children will not be demon-possessed. If they come to Him for deliverance, they will be delivered. Sin will not have dominion over you because you're under grace. So Jesus is saying to this man, if you can come to me as the one who promises to deliver my people from Satan's power, of course I can deliver you. There's no question about that. And I say how beautifully this man's faith is restored. Look at this. You can tell from his response that he, removes, he moves from doubting Jesus to one who is fully trusting him in the way that I was just describing. Verse 24 gives us this beautiful faith-filled response. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Now he's looking to Jesus, not only to deliver his child, but also to deliver him from the unbelief that is in him. With these words, he cast himself completely on the Lord, totally on the Lord. Lord, here I am, a sinner, take me, fix me, make me your own. You know, do, do the deliverance that you've promised. Jesus has to do it all. He's turned to him. He's looking to him. And you see that having restored this man's faith, Jesus then graciously delivers his demon-possessed son. The story is wonderful and dramatic. Let's look at it. Mark 9, 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, now of course, remember what happened. The, the, the boy began to, uh, to, to manifest these, these symptoms and to go on the floor and on the ground and all these things. And so the crowd is taking notice and they've all been in this dispute and thing, things going on, seeing Jesus come. And they all come running together. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? So Jesus saw them coming. And it says, he saw that. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Notice that Jesus commands the spirit not only to depart, but also to never come back again. Permanent deliverance. See, Satan can come and go if he wants to. I remember one time when I was talking to a young woman who was an unbeliever, and she told about spirits that she had in her that counseled her and this sort of thing. And I began to talk about the glory of Jesus Christ. And she said they left. And I said, then what hinders you from coming to the Lord? And her response was that, oh, well, they'll come back. And I can't betray them. I don't want to betray them because they've been with me all these years. See, that's a, uh, Satan can come and go from, from people. But here, Jesus sends this spirit away never to come back. But he does not allow, the, but he does allow the unclean spirit to show his malice. Look at verse 26. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. So he had this little last effort here. This is so violent again with this boy. In verse 26, it continues saying, and he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. This is the way that the Lord often does when He delivers people, isn't He? Remember when uh, Moses went to Egypt? said, Pharaoh, God, the Lord says, let my people go. What happened? It got worse. The bondage was turned up. It was heated up even worse. Because then when God delivered them, it displayed the glory of God. He let Satan flex all of his muscles and show how strong he is. Give it all your strength. Let him see how strong. And then God squashes him out. Just like that, like Pharaoh, he raises him up, as he says, that my name might be glorified. Vessel of wrath. Verse 27 says, but Jesus took the boy by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. I think that's a deliberate picture there of, uh, of resurrection. You know, it's showing Jesus takes people who are in bondage, desperate bondage, and he raises them up to live. That's the gospel. We come to Christ 
and He delivers us. What a wonderful Savior we have. Now this man's faith is stronger than ever. He who had wickedly lived in such a way that his son from childhood had been taken over by a demon had now found the grace of the Lord and been granted full deliverance. God has authorized that believing parents can look to the Lord for the deliverance of their children. His promise is to us and to our children. When the children have come of age, they are responsible for their own faith. We pray for them and God may hear us. But then the promise must be received by them also. They must come in faith. When they are little children, we may represent them before God. David, for example, lost some of his children because of his unfaithfulness. God said that was the reason and was never able to see some of them restored. But the child that he had by adultery, though it died, David was sure that upon his repentance, David's repentance, the child had been taken to be with the Lord. For he said, I will certainly go to him. But what a grand thing for this man. Through his own fault, his son had been taken over by a demon from childhood. But now, through his own intercession, his son had been delivered. Both the man and his son have been raised up from spiritual death to spiritual life. Let us learn from this man to cast ourselves entirely upon the gracious Lord who promises to save all who come to him, us and our children. But now we must consider the nine disciples who had been brought to public shame by their failure and who would have ruined this man's faith if Jesus had not intervened. We see here how Jesus not only restores individuals, but also ministers. He will have faithful ministers in every generation. All through the ages, he has raised up those who call his people back to God for salvation. There's always a voice. The voice of Christ is always heard. Last week, we saw this with Elijah and how God used him to preserve a remnant of God's people. We're to pray that God will send forth laborers into his harvest. The Bible says, how shall they, how shall the people hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent, sent by God? There are always plenty of unfaithful ministers around. We need to pray that there will be faithful men who will be able to teach others in the way of the Lord. The failure of the nine disciples of Jesus was necessary in order to restore them as faithful ministers. Just as the failure at Ai was necessary in order to restore Israel to faithfulness in the Lord. Their humiliating failure exposed the fact that something was wrong, bad wrong. That They fully expected that they would be able to cast out the demon from this child. In other words, if you talk about faith the way the world often does, I believe it's going to happen. You know, I just believe that this is going to happen. They had that. They were totally confident that when they went to cast out this demon, they were, you know, they'd done this before. Jesus had bestowed on them power to cast out demons and also to heal people who are sick. And they had rejoiced that even the demons are subject to us. But this time, they tried and nothing happened. This, of course, was very troubling to them and it got them asking what went wrong? That's exactly what needed to happen. At the first opportunity they had, they asked Jesus about it. Look at verse 28. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? There's something that they, it, this was not something that they might or might not be able to do. Remember, they had a special gift as apostles from Christ that he had bestowed on them. And they were not supposed to fail ever at this. Not ever. Never do you have a prophet or apostle try to do a miracle and fail. Except here. It's only here. And only in a situation in which Jesus is at hand to rectify the matter. But I mean, for Moses or Elijah or Isaiah or Peter or John or Paul, there's never an occasion where they try to do a sign or wonder and it doesn't happen. If you're a prophet or an apostle, 
That's not the way it works. In fact, if it happens that way, it shows that you're a false apostle or a false prophet. That you don't really know the, that you're not really a prophet of the Lord. You see, they had a, a the, the Old Testament actually called for stoning of those who tried and could not perform a sign. Can you imagine Moses going before Pharaoh and saying, for instance, tomorrow darkness will be upon the land. And everybody gets up, it's perfectly light. Sun's shining all day. That's not the way it happens. When you're a prophet, what you say is what happens. When you go to heal someone, you don't try to heal them. Now, we pray for people. We're not given that gift where we can discern who is going to be healed and call them to be healed, and they are always healed. We pray for people in God's mercy, and we leave it in His hands. We pray differently for something like demon possession. If someone comes to us and they want to be delivered, they want to be saved, we pray with confidence that the Lord will deliver them because uh, that's something that he's promised to do if they are actually looking to the Lord. So these nine disciples want to know what went wrong. Because, I mean, they were, they were, this, this is a disqualifying thing for them. Jesus tells them the reason that they failed was their neglect of prayer. His words are in verse 29. So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Disciples have not been keeping up their prayers. It's not that they did not pray for this demon to be exercised, but that they tried to cast it out when they had been neglecting prayer. The literal translation is, this kind by nothing is able to go out if not in prayer and fasting. In other words, no matter what you may do to cast out demons, if you're, if, if you're not one who is in regular prayer, he's saying to his disciples, if you're not men who are in regular prayer, you can't cast them out. Calvin puts it like this. You are, a, that Jesus is saying to them, you are effeminate exorcists and seem as if you were engaged in a mock battle got up for amusement. And you, but you have to deal with a powerful adversary who will not yield to the battle has been fought out. Your faith must therefore be excited by prayer, and as you are slow and languid in your prayer, you must resort to fasting as an assistance. It's like a coach telling his team that they need to discipline themselves and exercise and practice and in what they eat and what they drink if they want to win a ball game. The disciples were in this case relying on their own strength when they should have been men who were in prayer depending on God, who are daily putting themselves in God's hands. In, a parallel, in the parallel account in Matthew of this passage, we get to hear more of what Jesus said to his disciples. It helps us understand the whole thing. When they ask him why they could not cast out the demon, we're given another thing that Jesus said to them at that time. In Matthew 17, 20, it says, So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. It's because of your unbelief you are not able. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible to you. So the root of their problem was unbelief manifested by prayerlessness. They had grown accustomed to casting out demons as a matter of course and were no longer looking to the Lord as the one who expelled the demons. They had become self-reliant. They were no longer praying and fasting before the Lord as dependent men. Perhaps while Jesus was gone on the mount with the other three apostles, these nine had become even more negligent in their prayers. You can be negligent of your prayers, of course, in the prayer meeting. But uh, they had perhaps even become more negligent. It's very akin to what happens later with them at Gethsemane. What happens at Gethsemane? At Gethsemane, Jesus earnestly warns his disciples. He forewarns them that you're going to deny me. You're going to deny that you know me. He says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And what do they do? They fall asleep. Repeatedly. They keep falling asleep. 
Who prays? Only Jesus prays. And they then, not being ready for the battle, fall when the battle gets hot. They have not learned to put on the whole armor of God. They suppose that they can serve God without prayer. Foolish, foolish disciples. They have failed because unlike their master, they have not learned to put themselves into God's hands. How many times do we see Jesus in the Gospels going apart to pray, going off to a mountain, going somewhere to pray and to seek the Lord? Many modern translations omit the words here and fasting, even though there are only a couple of manuscripts in which they are not found. The reason for doing so is more on interpretive grounds than a lack of evidence from manuscripts. The reason is because the interpreters point out that Jesus had told the Pharisees and John's disciples that his disciples would not fast as long as he was with them. But that misses the point. When Jesus spoke about that, he was talking about the routine fast. That's what they had accused his disciples of not participating in. The routine fasts that were kept in which prayer was made for the Messiah to come. So they had regular fast days and the focus of those prayers was for the Messiah to come. Jesus' point was that those fasts were not appropriate because he was here. He said, how can they fast like that when the bridegroom is here? He wasn't saying they shouldn't call on the name of the Lord because I'm here. They shouldn't look for God's help because I'm here. Jesus himself did that all the time. And he urges his disciples to do that. So when we see Jesus, he is very regular in prayer. And we often see him exhorting the disciples. We're told of him fasting. We're even told of him fasting for 40 days. Fasting is simply that which is joined to prayer that we might focus more intensely on our prayers to God. We set aside eating to devote ourselves to prayer. The neglect of real prayer is the cause of our lack of faith. It's a symptom of lack of faith as well. The two go hand in hand. So Jesus tells his disciples that they couldn't cast it out because of their unbelief. And he, and he also tells them that they could not cast it out because of their lack of prayer. And remember, the unbelief was not that they didn't think they could do it. They thought they could do it. The unbelief is that they were not resting in the hands of God. They, had not pray, they were not men of prayer that were putting themselves in God's hands. That's why they fail. Question for you. Do you have failure in your service to the Lord that you ought not to have? I'm not talking about trials, persecution, sickness, crosses. we are told that we'll have those things. But I'm talking about if sin and Satan have dominion over you. That's a problem. Do you have anxiety, fear, depression, a cold heart, consuming lust, anger, bitterness, sluggish service to God, a lack of interest in His Word, an inability to impact others for the Lord that you are not delivered from? These things that you are not delivered from, but in constant bondage. If so, it's because of your unbelief. You're not looking to the Lord to keep you and to sustain you and to empower you with His grace. You're trying to serve God without dedicated prayer. No wonder you're weak. How can you expect to be strong without the living God? Perhaps today He will wake, awaken you to your need to call on the Lord. The way He awakened the man with the demon-possessed son. And the way he graciously got the attention of his disciples to show them their unbelief and their lack of prayer. We do not need more formal prayers. We need earnest prayers in which we truly turn to our gracious Lord for deliverance, the deliverance that he has promised. Sin will not have dominion over you, for you are under grace. Please stand and let's indeed pray.
Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the promises that you have made to your covenant people. You have not promised us in this world great riches, perfect health, prosperity of the kind that the Gentiles seek. Though you often give us those things, but what you have promised to us is that you will give us those things of what is sufficient for us. But what you've promised above all things is that you will take us, Lord, sinners that we are, so that sin does not have dominion over us, and so that we receive pardon for those sins. And I pray, Lord, pray for every single one of us, whether we're a young person in school, whether we're a middle-aged person at work, whether we're a senior, wherever we are, Lord, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would be a people who lean on You, a people who continually put ourselves in Your hands, in the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the deliverance that You have promised. Father, that we would not be as, a, as covenant people ought not to be, we would have the blessings that you have promised to us. Father, that you would grant us deliverance and that we would have the freedom from the shackles of sin and disobedience. Father, we know that we will continue to come short in many ways. As the Apostle Paul said, the good that I want to do, I do not do, but the evil I hate, that I do. But he also insisted that sin does not have dominion over us in the Lord. It did not have dominion over him. He had been set free. And though he fought daily with ongoing corruption and sin, he was freed from bondage to that sin. And Father, we pray that we would know that same deliverance, the salvation that comes to all who call on the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. And we pray that we would be able to spread the hope of the gospel. You're such a gracious God. Lord, here we are, people that have had the gospel so long and that so often give ourselves over to what is not of God. Oh, Lord, you continue to stretch out your hand to us. You continue to call us and beckon us. We pray, oh, Lord, that we would hear your call and that we would come and we would receive the blessing and the grace that you have for your own. Father, thank you for how you delivered your people out of Egypt as a type and picture of how you deliver us from Satan and his grip on us in order that we might go and serve you. Oh, Father, grant us this grace, we pray. Help us to encourage one another and to uphold one another and to pray for one another as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare now to come to the Lord's Supper. <coughs> as we saw in the sermon this morning, it's very important for us to maintain and nurture our faith. Jesus told his disciples that they needed to keep up their prayer and fasting if they were going to be able to carry out their ministry. Ministry and just plain Christian living cannot be done apart from faith that actually looks to God for the help that he promises. That's what faith does. Of course, it is essential for all of us to continue feeding on God's word. The word is our primary diet. But the word directs us to always feed on Christ, to look to him for grace and deliverance and to help us remember that faith and dependence on Christ himself is to be our focus. The Lord has also given us the sacraments, the sacraments to point us directly to Christ so that we don't get into a mode where we have the word that directs us to Christ without actually looking to Christ. That's why after we hear the word preached, 
we come to the Lord's table so that we look to Christ himself as he has promised to us in the word. We see our need of him and then we come to him and we say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Give me the grace that I need. The Lord appointed baptism for us when we first come into his covenant, whether as infants with believing parents or as adults who come to join with the believing people of God from outside, we're to improve our baptism by remembering that it is Christ who washes us by his spirit when we come to him so that we are cleansed from our sin and guilt. There is now no condemnation for us because we're in Christ Jesus. And there is grace for us to escape. He's delivered us from the power and dominion of sin. The Lord also appointed the Lord's Supper to be a regular ongoing aid to our faith and walk. Each time we come to the table, we are to remember that Christ was crucified for us. We're look, to look to him to nourish us in our faith so that we can continue serving him and not be brought under the dominion of sin. That by faith in him, sin's dominion is broken. The Lord's table sets out before us. We must guard ourselves lest we begin to make it a mere routine where we merely ingest bread and wine without thought. We're to feed our souls at this table. And that means that we must re re reset our faith as those seeking the grace and blessing of Christ who is crucified for us. Another way to say that is we look afresh to our Savior. We must come to him in such a way that we are helped that we're helped to continue to look to our gracious Lord who has promised deliverance from evil. Here are the words of institution given by the Apostle Paul in which he warns us not to come in a thoughtless manner in which we do not discern the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes." Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So You may come to this table if you are baptized and are a communicant member in good standing of a faithful church. If you're not, we'd be happy to talk to you about uniting with this church. Jesus calls all of us to be under the care of elders that he has appointed in a local church. And of course, if you come to this table, whether you're a member or not, you need to be looking to Jesus for the deliverance that is promised through him as the one who was crucified. So let's ask the Lord to bless us as we come. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread and the wine that is on this table that represents to us our Lord Jesus Christ, so that in taking this bread and drinking this wine, that we may be also expecting to receive him, that we receive him who gives us life, who delivers us from the power and dominion of sin, Father, we need Christ crucified. We cannot deliver ourselves. The help of man is vain. It accomplishes nothing. Our own strength is weak. We cannot deliver ourselves. But we thank you that we have a Savior that you have sent, the very Son of God who has come from heaven in order to die on the cross for us. How gracious he has been to us. Lord, receive us now. We present ourselves to you, Lord asking you, O Lord, to work in us. Father, deliver us from the dominion of sin. Set us free 
that we might be your servants. Father, we're no longer slaves of sin. We're now the slaves of righteousness. We're now the servants of Jesus Christ forever, if we have indeed come to him. Oh Lord, we thank you that we have that promise that is represented to us in baptism, that we die with Christ and that we're raised again through union with him. We're identified with him as the one crucified. We thank you, Lord, it's represented here at this table. Oh, Lord, feed us. Feed us with our life-giving Savior. Father, we do not try to come apart from Him. We come only to Him and through Him before You. We praise You, Lord, for the hope that we have and the assurance. In Jesus' name, amen. You may eat and drink as soon the blessing of the Lord. And, and may you indeed receive the blessing of the Lord. Now may the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Amen.